I'm delighted to see so many guests from the world of media, politics, as well as from the industry in just about all of its aspects. A few years ago, on the last occasion that Steve Martin presented the Oscars, he mentioned that he just handed in a new script and the studio didn't change a word. He swiftly added that the word they didn't change was on page 87. <laughs> well, the script is in every respect the blueprint. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I liked it too. <laughs> It's in every respect the blueprint for any production, and I was personally delighted on uh, Monday morning that Hurt Locker won the Oscar for Best Screenplay. I'd also like to add my warm congratulations to Catherine Bigelow on her personal achievement, as well as the incredibly well-deserved success of what was clearly a, a labour of love on the part of everyone involved in bringing her film to the screen. Worth mentioning that whilst my career at Columbia Pictures was not stellar, one of the things we did do was give uh, a young then cinematographer called Catherine Bigelow her first development deal, so I feel some small sense of ownership, very small sense of ownership. In fact, 2009 was an outstanding year for the cinema in pretty well every respect. UK admissions reached a seven-year high of 173.5 million, while UK box office receipts hit an all-time high at just over a billion in ticket sales in the UK and Ireland. Creativity and diversity also flourished from an education to up, from a single to a serious man, and from the Hurt Locker to Avatar. London alone accounted for more than 40 million admissions and well over a quarter of a billion pounds of box office. These are receipts that are a new record for our capital city. And I'm sure I'm not the only person here this morning who believes that film is the most dynamic and influential of our creative industries and that at its best, it retains the power to speak memorably to people of every age and background in ways that are the envy of other forms of popular culture. This morning I'm going to focus, if you don't mind, on the cinema and its role as the primary shop window and the most sought-after launchpad for every movie. But I'll also range more widely than that and attempt to at least touch on the, the whole of the creative industries. In looking ahead at what shows every sign of being another prodigious year, I also want to reflect on the implications of the momentous technological shifts that are disrupting business models right across the creative and media industries, of which the cinema is just one key part. And I'd also like to offer a few interconnected challenges, an agenda of sorts to all three sectors, media, politics and cinema, that's represented among you here this morning. But first things first. The business of creating and sharing stories is a terrific, if inherently very risky, way of earning your living. But we in the UK seem to increasingly excel at it. You'll probably be as surprised as I am to learn that the 20 highest grossing films in UK cinemas in the last decade, that's to say the years 2000 to 2009, of, during that decade, no fewer than 15 of those movies were based on British stories. If you don't believe me, you can check the full chart in the new FDA yearbook. And that alone ought to encourage you to pick up a copy on your way out. The 76 pages are all but buzzing with rent track data and industry comment on the last 12 months, much of it published for the very first time this morning. The commercial cinema's wonderful capacity to deliver top-flight escapism shines through the numbers. One pound in every five pounds spent at the UK box office in 2009 went to comedies, still the highest grossing genre. A further one pound in every seven pounds went to animation, despite the fact that only 14 animated films were actually released last year. Happily for us, movie enthusiasts seem to have an insatiable appetite for the industry's raw material. Stories well told are nourishment for their imaginations. Make no mistake, even in an interactive digital world, a linear narrative only adds to cinema's mighty power to engage and to excite people. Every filmmaker today, every bit as much as in the past, aspires to having their work presented in the cinema, where the latest releases can be seen to their very best effect. Let's look at Avatar, the success of which has raised the bar for contemporary cinema as a whole. It's well, well, it's well worth reminding ourselves, because it's still very important to consumers, that the unique cinema experience works on a multiplicity of levels. For the individual audience member, it provides the most immersive form of storytelling that's ever been invented. Paradoxically, perhaps, it also delivers a strong sense of togetherness as the roller coaster experience and the whole gamut of emotions are shared with those around us. In today's parlance, the cinema is probably the ultimate social media experience. 2009 admissions were 21% ahead of those in 2000, demonstrating a quite remarkable buoyancy right across the whole of the decade. Just a couple more numbers, but they're pretty important ones. 
The cinema continues to exert a strong economic multiplier effect, driving consumption of films in subsequent formats and generating additional expenditure. So for every one pound spent at the box office, an additional two pounds is added to UK PLC's turnover in the form of extra spending triggered directly and measurably by the trip to the movies. All told, British cinema delivers a gross value well in excess of three billion pounds, far beyond the one billion spent on tickets. And that's just cinema. It doesn't take account of subsequent platforms. In fact, cinema industry economics don't even begin to describe the total impact of the medium. But here, as always, comes the caveat. Let's place this success in a wider context. The same pattern of box office growth was reflected in many countries last year, including the United States, France and Germany. And in fairness, the movies were not the only sector to literally defy the recession. Lots of top quality out-of-home experiences continue to, to perform remarkably well. In fact, London's West End Theatre enjoyed an all-time record year. So did the O2 at Greenwich, now the most successful music venue in the world. More than half a million people around the UK saw Michael McIntyre live on stage while his Christmas DVD became the fastest selling stand-up DVD that's ever been released. So although my remarks about the cinema are suitably, I think, celebratory, there could be not one shred of complacency. Not with such intense competition for leisure time, both in and out of the home, becoming more and more popular. It's a point I'll return to a little later on. Many forms of leisure activity, from stand-up to food and drink, from antiques to sport, from music to fashion, are covered by regular, dedicated programmes on television and online. But where on earth are the edgy magazine shows or the contemporary panel shows or the audience participation shows themed to the movies? The mass public interest in films, enjoyed by millions and millions of people every week, is already ignored by the current output of our national broadcasters. There are, of course, the publicly voted National Movie Awards and the Orange British Academy, Award, Film, uh, Academy Film Awards, both major peak time events celebrating the cinema in their different ways. But I'm talking about the type of recurring prime time entertainment that our national obsession with the cinema would surely justify. My first challenge for media executives and commissioning editors is to create a compelling format with cinema at its core. Now surely here's a gap crying out to be filled with a smart, modern format. Surely the more, attention, the more attention cinema gets, the better it becomes for those broadcasters who will eventually, inevitably, be showing those movies on their channels. So my advice is, don't let the well-rehearsed arguments regarding clip clearances deter you from at least giving this a crack. There's a win-win situation here just waiting for the person who's imaginative enough to develop it. Not just imaginative enough either, determined enough.